The Metis Tech Show. Welcome to the Metis Tech Show, a show for HVAC professionals by HVAC professionals. The Metis Tech Show. All right, so so we've gotten a ton of feedback on one of our episodes where we talked about fat side up, fat side down. Uh, there's a big debate, and <laughs> on our show today we have a pit master, and this guy uh, works for Mitsubishi, and he's uh, an instructor, and he competes. And I'm not kidding. He compete, just recently competed in a, uh, a barbecue event in Georgia, a big barbecue event, and he came in. Uh, what place did you come in on that? Uh, seventh place out seventh. of 30 teams. That's did, amazing. Wait a That's, minute. Yeah. Did you have your barbecue sauce there? No, but I can bring some in for you guys. Because I am not a barbecue sauce person. Me I just neither. prefer no sauce, but that was like the best barbecue sauce. It, it was. Thank you. It, I, and you're not just saying that. No, um, I wouldn't lie about barbecue sauce. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what was in there, but it was, I love sweet. With the little heat, yeah, and it, it was just it had everything. It was just it was amazing. a uh, it's a black uh, blackberry uh, barbecue sauce that I make. Yeah, and I with think the little heat yeah. at the end. I think I like Juan heat. ended up drinking the bottle. That little yeah. yes, yes he did. <laughs> yes. I was saving it to cook uh, cook something, and I couldn't finish it because he took half the bottle. <laughs> I don't know. I I agree with Paul. The best barbecue is no sauce. Is no sauce. I, I agree. Time, I hundred percent. I agree. The only time you put sauce on something is if you. Chop it up, put it in a crock pot, let it simmer. Oh, that's delicious. If you need to put well, sauce you, you, on you it. You said the word crock pot to me. And well, after it's already done, after okay. it's already been smoked, and you I get want it. something to do with it, you want to chop it up. Put chop it, it up. Yeah, and just let it simmer in the barbecue sauce and put it on a sandwich. Delicious. And, and that's the thing about Texas barbecue. Oh, um, it, you know, it, it, they use a lot of dry rub on the ribs. They do. And it's just a dry piece of meat and it's so flavorful it's just perfect and all balance. they do is just rub and that's it yeah and i just get a little side of barbecue sauce but anyway back to the fat side up fat side down yeah. this there's, there's science behind yeah. this there is it depends on uh what type of meat you're cooking right so for me and what type of smoker you're using too but typically for me if i'm cooking a pork butt i'm always doing fi- fat side up Right, okay. because I want that. I want all those juices flowing in. I want the juices going into the meat, right? Because that's where all the flavor comes in. Now, there's a debate on the brisket side of things. Uh, people do fast side up or five side down. The reason why a brisket is a lean, leaner piece of meat. It's right? muscle. It's muscle. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. It is right. So um, when you get a, we call it the packer, a, a brisket, which yep. is the, it's the whole the whole thing, is now. The packer is, you know, when you with the burn ends, that's yep. where all the, oh, the oh, that's ends. that's the money. Now the the burn ends come from the point. It's the point. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so that's, the brisket. That is where the, the that to me by far beats any piece of meat. So already that makes sense. So you're fat side up with the pork butt because the pork butt lets the juices come through. You can where the brisket. It's a muscle. It's a lot the muscle, tougher. But you can shoot. I, I, I do fat side down. I mean, fat side up and brisket. I do. Uh, uh, on the point in, I, it, I'm okay with it because I have a lot more leeway with it. Now, on the opposite side of the brisket, that's the where their most lean is. So you almost want to protect that. So when you go to the grocery store, right, you can buy a packer, which is the whole, the whole brisket, or you can get it without the point. It's just a flat. Right. Yep. If I'm cooking just a flat, I'm cooking that fat, fat side, uh, fat side down to protect it because that is a very lean piece of meat and you can overcook it. Oh, yeah. And with the flame coming from the bottom. Bottom. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, yeah. And it, again, even with the flame, you got an offset. I cook with an offset smoker. Um, that's what I prefer. I love cooking offset. Reverse flow is my personal favorite where the uh, smoke goes on the bottom. There's a plate where it, uh, come, it goes through, and then the smoke comes on top, travels through, and it goes to the smokestack. Now, that's different than my smoker, which is a pellet smoker. Yeah, and that's I yeah. get that. It's a pellet smoker. Your pellet smoker is actually, believe it or not, still an offset. It goes from uh, from right to left or whatever. Smoke comes from one end, and your stack is probably on the opposite side, and it goes up. So my firebox is on the left side if I'm yep. facing my smoker, and my chimney is on the right side. That's an offset smoker. And it's got a plate, like you yeah. said, oh, okay. and all the drippings yeah. come yeah, down you, that plate. Yeah. Yep. 
Exactly. Sort of a little gutter on the other side. Yeah. Right. So that's where, and that's why I get a lot of conversations. So Scott, should I, you know, I'm going to get into smoking, you know, should I get an offset smoker? And I'm like, absolutely, but get a pellet. They're like, what? And I'm like, do you want to sleep at night? I mean, or do you want to stay up and be the stick burner, yeah. right? Yeah, that's a good point. So, yeah, so I, I always tell the guys, like, you're not getting a competition. Don't worry about it. Get a pellet smoker. You're still going to get flavor. Pellet smoking now is actually in competitions. And you more said it and more. forget it. Yeah, you said it and you forget yeah. it. Now, you can say for, forget it, but for me, I'm still going to be uh, moist. I always spritz my uh, brisket or whatever I'm cooking. Yeah, so you got a spray bottle with some cider. Yeah, I, I do apple and apple cider. To make it okay. real simple. But yeah. I'm getting hungry. I've only eaten four times today. <laughs> and I'm hungry again. Now I'm hungry again. I wasn't hungry. That's the yeah. nice part about being at these events. You're never going to stop. Yeah, by the way, we're at the DSG Conference, 2023 DSG Conference in Alpharetta, Georgia, and we're at the Marriott Hotel um, live with all this right. podcast. So yeah. we're gonna be, um, it's just a, a, a great time with all of the DSGs. We'll probably see 300 or so G- DSGs come through this week, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, yeah. I think we got 160 this week. We have two sessions, Monday and Tuesday, and then uh, Thursday and Friday. I think in total, we have 380 some odd DSGs. I don't know the exact number. I knew it an hour ago before we started talking about. Sounds you know, about right. Briskets. Um, about right. Not all of them are coming here, but you know, a lot of them are. I think there's 160 to 180 in each session. So listen, Scott, you're a professional, what do you call it? Barbecue or smoker, pit master. Yeah. So the answer, because we got, whoa, oh, duck. <laughs> <laughs> you just get hit with a brisket. Yeah. No. <laughs> so believe it or not, this is the most controversial topic we've ever had You're going to get that. The and show. the easiest way I'm going to answer it, anyone that's listening to this it's to your discretion. Yeah. Okay. And everyone's going to want, you're going to get one wave and saying that's wrong. It has to be fat side up. Or are you going to get the other wave saying wrong? It's the other way. Right. It, so it comes down to the thickness of the fat on the brisket. Where is your flame coming from? What type of smoker are you yeah. using? There's a lot of things that go it, it, into there this. There is. And, but they, it, if you, when in doubt, just do fat side up when yeah. in doubt. Okay. That's what I tell people. No more emails. It's fat side up, and that's it. Oh, good luck. You know you're going to get emails. Yeah. And then yeah, I'm going to email you directly to me, I'm sure. But we'll Let me get tell there. you a funny story about when I first joined the Navy, got out of boot camp, and went to my first ship. Well, I was born and raised in Texas, so I was like, man, i got to have a barbecue sandwich. I was in Virginia, in Norfolk, Virginia. Went to a little bar to get something to eat. Ah, oh, there's a barbecue sandwich on the menu. I'm going to get <laughs> right. it. I bit into that thing, and it was pork. I was like, what in the world are they feeding me here? Because I was being, like I said, being born and raised in Texas. I thought with your accent you were from Brooklyn. No. (laughs) (laughs) No, not today. (laughs) Just saying. But, yeah, that was was an eye-waking experience. Texas barbecue, man. That's where it's at right there. And that person who claims to be from Texas, even though he sounds like he's from Brooklyn, that is Ralph Wolf. He's one of our DSGs, a member of the Diamond Service Group. Ralph, tell us a bit about yourself. Hmm. Where do I start? So I've been in the industry since 93. Yeah. 30 years now. Okay. Started off as a, uh, right after I got out of the Navy, I'd answer ad and paper for a sheet metal installer. And I was like, I built sheet metal in the Navy for four years. I can do it out here. Turned out yep. to be a commercial heating and air company doing duck work. When I was done with that interview, I had a set of keys to a van, a set of drawings, and, be, and said, be at this location Monday morning. Yep. I had no idea even how to work a thermostat. You know, 30 years later, here I am. Nice. Oh, well, welcome to the Metis Tech Show. Appreciate it. All right. So what are we going to talk about today? So, by the way, we got Scott Tallman here, oh, the, yeah. um, the pit master himself. Uh, he's the instructor out of the Swanee Training Center. We have Paul Shaves, uh, senior t- technical training manager, and myself, Steve Pimentel, uh, training manager for uh, the instructors in the training centers uh, at Metis. And by the way, um, we don't mention this quite often, but this is the Metis Tech Show. What does Metis st- stand for? Mitsubishi Electric Train U.S. Oh, All right, oh, just so oh, you know. Is that what it's it means? not the other way? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I was asking. I'm looking around. Is he asking me? Is it a rhetorical question? Yeah, I stumped you guys a little bit. Yeah. You don't even know where you work. I was oh, oh, I know where I work. I just you. get the two, uh, two things mixed up on my introduction. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to talk about triple evacuation today. 
and a little bit of pressure testing and and basically what are we doing to our system what kind of tools are we using are we using the right tools out in the field now when i graduated from refrigeration school i went to high school i went to a vocational school so i took four years of refrigeration and they basically handed me a set of basic manifold gauges regular analog. and we left the school with those yep. and and they said listen charge with these pressure test with these pull a vacuum yep. with these do everything, everything with these gauges do. and it, it's not it's it wasn't correct no, right no. um you know we should be using and we've learned i've learned in in my 30 i've been in the trade 30 years as well ralph and i've learned that you know those gauges are great for pressure testing they're great for charging and that was a, not always a great fit for pulling a vacuum, vacuum. right? We, they, there are vacuum-rated hoses out there. Let's start right from the beginning. We have a system, and we've pressure-tested this system to 600 PSI. What Mitsubishi? Of nitrogen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. nitrogen. Dry nitrogen. Yeah. Dry, nitrogen. dry nitrogen because yeah. there is a difference. And I didn't realize this until one time in the field. Couldn't pull a vacuum no matter what. And realized we had a different grade of nitrogen. It yep. wasn't dry nitrogen. It was some other nitri nitrogen, and so every time you put it in the system, you were adding moisture. Add moisture, moisture to the system, system. Right. So, so it has to be dry nitrogen. Hopefully, your supply house doesn't carry anything else. It could be the luck of the draw, depending on the supplier of the nitrogen, and if the bottles have been cleaned properly and whatnot, they had they could have moisture in yeah. the bottle. Yeah, which is not good. So yeah, the, uh, you know, me, with me working <laughs> at a hospital for ten years, they used to lug in. Just bottles of bottles nitrogen, of right? Uh, medical nitrogen is a big difference. Totally different. That yeah. is a very dry nitrogen. Uh, what we're getting at the supply house is just the basic um, the nitrogen. It's less expensive than medical grade nitrogen. Right. Okay. So we are pressurize the system. We're all done. Everything, the piping is done. We pressurize it to 600 PSI of nitrogen. Now what? So it, it, can I lose pressure? Is there a pressure temperature relationship with nitrogen? Absolutely. Let's talk yes. about that. Yes. Right? Uh, I could put nitrogen into a system 600 PSI and let's say it's 80 degrees out. Come back the following morning, I got a crisp 50 degree morning, and I look at my gauges and I'm, whoa, wait a minute, I lost a couple of pounds. Mm -hmm. Did I actually lose a couple of pounds? No. No. I could come back and in the afternoon it's 80 degrees out again and my pressure go back up. So there is a pressure temperature relationship with nitrogen. Don't let that fool you, right? And there are actually some apps out there that'll tell you what that pressure difference is um, with, with nitrogen, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there, it's not as drastic as with refrigerant, per se, or even, but it is, it is there, so you need to recognize it. Is it enough to make you go looking for a leak? Yeah, that was going to, I mean, would that be enough to? No. If, if you just put it in, and within 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you lose, you lose something. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Then, then, that, yeah I know do. that. But, I mean, that piece but of overnight, it. overnight, no, no. Yeah. All right. So, so we've got that out of the way. Let's um, say it holds. Let's just say for the sake of argument, you pressurize it to 600 pounds and it holds. Yes. So we're good to go. Good to go. We let the nitrogen out. Yeah. So we're going to, why are we, uh, can we pull one single evacuation on the system? Can we just turn that vacuum pump on and just let it rip? Preferably not. Yeah. Oh, that's a famous one. They just day. let it rip to 200 microns right. and call it a day. Can I go back? Can I go back and talk about school? Because I got yeah. just. A, I only have a couple of more years' experience than you guys. But when I was in school, it was a refrigeration school. It was a private school. The instructors there they hammered home triple evacuation, triple evacuation, triple evacuation. Yeah, see, they didn't that's mind. That's what they taught, yeah. right? But then you get out into the. You get out and go to work for somebody, and you work for an old timer, which is what I am now. But right. when I was a kid. They said, don't, it's a waste of time. It, it, don't do a triple evacuation. Run the vacuum pump for 20 minutes. There was no micron gauge, right? There was nothing. It was just run a vacuum for 20 minutes and you're all set. And that was R22. Yeah. yeah. It makes a go difference. smoke a cigarette. Yeah, we we relied on our, uh, on our inches of mercury on a gauge. Yeah. That was it. And that yeah. was wrong. And that was, wrong. It was I, wrong. I actually worked for a guy one time and he did not believe in pulling the vacuum. He, you could not get it through his head. That he was like, well, there's nothing there. You're not doing nothing. He, he he just could not grasp the concept. I worked for a company. Their idea of pulling a vacuum was, was running the it. system dry, running the compressor dry oh. for for just a few seconds, 
So you'd pull a suction on the suction side, and you know, and that yep. was it. You know, yep. and you know, the high side would be out, and I go, what? I mean, that was it. Like I didn't work there very long. Was, yeah, know. I've I, we've seen a lot of bad habits. I've seen a lot of bad habits over the years. I've seen where they blow some refrigerant oh, on one end and through. just yeah, oh, yeah. that's just all good, he did. That's how yeah. he pulled a vacuum. Yeah. Well, just just blowing it through, it through. Yeah. and uh, and those systems ran and and. And, and but you know did they have their issues you know you could have just a little bit of moisture in there get inside of a txv and just yeah. wreak havoc through the system so so ralph i let's just say i pull the single vacuum let's just for the sake of argument say i have a micron gauge yep all right which we'll talk about but we should have a micron right. gauge always i have a micron gauge i pull a single vacuum i bring it down to 500 microns what's the danger in doing just that or what's the drawback what can go wrong it, it's going to take you longer to get down to 500 microns without pulling a triple evacuation. Yeah. Truly. Yeah. I mean, it's, if you're down in 500 microns, you should be good. But how long did it take you to get down there? Okay. And what equipment did you use to get down there? Right. Did you use your, your manifold with just your quarter-inch hoses? Did you pull the core out? Right. You know, right. how did you get there? So we can save, we can save time on pulling a vacuum by just using half inch hose right three quarter inch hose yep you could do the same job with a two cfm pump three quarter inch hose and removing the core and removing the cores yeah. as you can a nine cfm pump and a quarter inch hose and do it a lot faster yeah the more cfm the, the larger oh, yeah. the vacuum pump is not necessarily a good thing no no because if you pull the vacuum too fast what can happen oh you can freeze up any moisture that's yeah. in the system. Well, that's, uh, that's what I was going to ask you. Um, so if you just, like when your example is, it'll take time to go down to 500 microns. Right. But if you're just doing a one-time shot, 500 microns, and you said it takes a while, but isn't it potentially some, uh, some freezing? Well, there could be, and, but that's the nice part about the technology that we have today. You can have a good micron gauge, and it'll give you all the information and let you know if you're – K test was good, and the decay test is basically how much moisture is in the system. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna you can do a rise test like you said, and it'll, yeah. it'll well, tell you because yeah. you, you can have moisture in there as a vapor, and it yeah. can freeze. And it it skips free. the liquid phase; it's it's the sublimation in reverse. It right. skips the liquid phase and goes right to a solid. And if you now just put refrigerant in there and go on, you've got moisture in the exactly. system. That's you how. could have you could have actually depended on how much moisture was in the system. You could have froze it up. You know, it frees up in a line, and you pull a vacuum against it. You may not pull a good vacuum yeah. on the backside. I've, of I've got a video. Yeah. I've got a video that a colleague of yours sent me, and it's opening up the line after it was in a vacuum, and a piece of a chunk of ice comes uh -huh. out of the line. Yeah. Oh wow! Right? And it's and it, and it was boiling, boiling off. off. It was yeah. sitting it was there boiling, boiling off. off. Wow! It's, it's cool. amazing. It's crazy. Can we say yeah. who it was? Of course. You it can. was Paul Hale. Ah, uh, a good old Paul. All right. Yeah, he's, he's a, a good, good guy. guy. Yeah. Yeah, that was a really interesting video. All right, so then back to the hoses. There are hoses. I mean, you got a manifold with a red, yellow, and blue hose. Right. Those hoses aren't necessarily rated for a vacuum. No, they're not. The, the, the red, yellow, and blue that we're all used to seeing are not vacuum-rated hoses. Generally, the black hoses are, are going to be vacuum-rated. But So let's get back a little bit. Let's get back to the vacuum pump. So there's a quarter-inch port on that hose, mm -hmm. on that vacuum pump. You know what it's for? What's it for? It is for <laughs> checking your vacuum pump to make sure it actually pulls down because every vacuum pump is rated for so many microns. So that quarter inch port was a test port to put your micron gauge on. Ah, oh, interesting. Because you have for. another port really? on the other side. Right, right, right. Interesting. Right. Yeah. I just learned something. Yeah, yeah. I, no. <laughs> that quarter inch port was never meant to pull a vacuum through. But because we're. You know, techs are, I'm going to say it because when I was in the field, I was lazy. Yeah. You know, and, and yeah. you know, I give. We're taught bad habits, too. Yeah, yeah we're we're taught, well, we are taught very bad it, habits. Our industry is full of bad habits. But I'll tell you something I tell guys in class. I've been in the field for 30 years. I've got 16 years experience, but I got one year experience 14 times. Mm. It makes sense. And that's, I tell them, I say, you know, and they're looking at me like, what? Well, it wasn't until I decided to figure out how this stuff actually worked is when I started gaining the experience that I have today. Right. 
And that's the thing. A lot of you have to understand. It's not just do this and do that. You should understand why you're doing it. Right. And I think that's where right, a lot right, of guys right. miss it. Yeah. And then, so if you understood that that port was just to check to see if your vacuum pump oil was good, because we all hear that after every vacuum, change a vacuum pump oil. Well, if you're doing a little one to one, you shouldn't have to. Yeah. Not right. after every one. Yeah. It's you know if you're if your micron gauge is rated for I mean the vacuum pump's rated for thirty five mic- microns, and you pull a vacuum using your micron gauge to check it, and it's stuck at a hundred and it won't go any farther. It's time to change your vacuum yeah. pump. Hmm. Yeah. And, and what size vacuum pump would you recommend the average tech have? <laughs> so it depends on what you're doing, what size system you're doing it, but it, like. Just a regular average tech, you can use a, with the proper hoses, you can use a 2 CFM pump, two quarter, two three quarter inch hoses, and pull a five ton coil down with 55 or 50 foot of line set in seven minutes. Wow. It's impressive. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So we talked about the hoses, we talked about the pump. What about a micron gauge? Is that required? Yes. Right. Yeah, because how else course, you gonna yeah. you gonna yeah. stick your finger on one side <laughs> and let it just like your finger yeah. like oh yeah you're good yeah, yeah. we got the old school way you, put in. you got the old school way you got inches of mercury on your gauge oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah we do use that but for years now we've established you can't use your gauges because you're using your quarter inch hose. ah right that's right right so just to tell you how old I am my first vacuum I'm sorry my first uh, micron gauge right was an analog and it had it had a battery. In it, and it had, I forget what it was. It was something you had to put on it to calibrate it every time you used it. Right, right. I, and that's all I remember. I just remembered it was such a pain to do that I just said, ah, who needs a micron gauge? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's such a pain to do, but. but the technology today. But wait a second, no Paul. This, this technology has been around for, since refrigeration has been, along, been right. around. It's just that as the years go on, we just get lazier and lazier. Lazy. And, lazy. and now you try to tell guys, and they're like, Oh, that's just new stuff. We don't need to do that. Yeah. Well, no, no. it's not new. It's old. We just forgot and, how and, to do it. And also, R22, let's talk air conditioning. Oh, yeah. R22 is a lot more forgiving, forgiving. to moisture yeah. than R410A yeah. is. Yeah. So we got to realize that, too. All right. So we got the nitrogen. We got the vacuum pump settled. We got the hoses. And you said I can bring it down with a, the proper hoses, the right vacuum pump, a five-ton system, 50 feet of line set. About seven minutes. I right. got a micron gauge on there. What am I bringing it down to? It depends on, you know, once you get to 500 microns, you know, you do a rise test with your micron gauge to make sure. And in today's world, the proper, the, the micron gauges we have today, this whole do an hour rise test or whatever, that's a, almost a thing of the past. Yeah. Truly. Yeah, because if you use some of the um, the, the newer apps that go right. along with right, right. the micron gauge, it'll, it'll, it'll do a rise test minutes. for you. It'll, yeah, it'll well, say pass yeah. or fail, yeah. right? Yeah. So I want to back up a second. And um, earlier when we were speaking uh, before this podcast, you mentioned pulling a vacuum through Schrader's. Oh, yeah, yeah. Schrader's. So well, how big of a deal is it, you know, it, it, if, if I leave the Schrader's in, am I really, you know, struggling to pull a vacuum in that system so how many cf films well let me ask you a question so everybody thinks the bigger the pump the better right yeah yep. right yep. everybody True. thinks that so they go spend all this money to buy nine cf film seven eight, nine, nine yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah seven was one right. yeah it's a seven yeah but what they fail to do is pull the cores out and pull a vacuum through <laughs> a core remover yeah sure. right because of a core a, a schrader core is seven point seven cf film Right, that little quarter inch hose you're pulling through, one CFM. So, so you spend all this money. Yeah, at the end, and all this money, the and you're doing right. the same right. rate, yeah. uh, a seven CFM vacuum oh, it's versus it's less. a two it's less. CFM, so, whatever. So you straight do, a core remover is a must. It's oh, a must. It's definitely Absolutely. a must. Absolutely, I agree. Okay. You know, you can do as good a vacuum with one hose straight from the pump into a valve core remover with a good sized hose than you can with a set of manifolds and pull in through your quarter inch hose. Good. You'd actually do a better job with one of the hose. Right. <laughs> and that's less leak points. Because how many leak points do you have on a set of manifolds? Yeah, yeah well, leak, there's just lot. three at the manifold <laughs> yeah. itself. And yeah. 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 All the connections. Yeah, yeah. all the connections, yeah. And do you know when, um, and I've been there myself, start pulling a vacuum through the gauges, 
and watch the gauges go up, you know, after I pull the vacuum without doing a triple vac, without, you know, using a micron gauge. And do I check my gauges and my hoses for a leak? Did I? No. I went spraying the coil everywhere I brazed because I didn't trust my my work. You're not checking your tools. I trust my tools more than I trusted my own work. And that was me. Um, So... So I'm one of those guys that was taught triple evac and went and did single evac. Mm-hmm. And then I said, you know what? And I did some research on it. And like you said, I keep learning and learning. Right, 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 right. So I'm going back to triple evac. And then I started it and everything leaks. Every single job leak, I did the same thing. Yeah. I'm checking my work. Nothing leaks. And then I finally decided, let me check my manifold and my hoses. I had the wrong hoses. Yeah, and yeah. that's what was leaking. Your gaskets. Yeah. Your gaskets. If you work on heat pumps, <laughs> I mean, no... You should be changing those gaskets and those hoses multiple times during that season because yep. those heat pumps running will tear a set of yeah. gaskets up. Yeah. So, but but some guys don't even check them; they just yeah. put it on there and yeah. it's leaking. And and I got up. I got to the point where I was I was still using the manifold and three hoses or two right. hoses actually. I got the black vacuum hoses and I had a manifold that I only used it for vacuum. Right. And I would put I would open once that was done I would open up the valves, put ten psi pressure in there take off the hoses and put on my regular manifold to do the rest of it. And that yeah. worked great. Yeah. But like I said, the technology, yeah. we're relearning what we right. should have never well, we forgotten. We never, yeah. we, we're, we're learning what we should have learned 30 years ago. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, we did. We just forgot it. Yeah. yeah. We, just, we just were too lazy. As you said, and a guilty as charged. No, I'm, I'm guilty. Or that's at where you guys are taught when you yeah. guys got in the field. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I fought the long battle for years on pulling a vacuum. I had a lot of people teach me great habits bad habits but bad habits, yeah. um, we talked about consolidating a setup consolidating to hoses a shut off and just a micron gauge right and that's going to change how you pull a vacuum but let's talk about as instructors at mitsubishi how what do we teach for a triple evacuation right we're, we're pulling down to four thousand microns 4, 000, yep, that's 4, that's 000. the start right yep we're gonna we're gonna pull down to four thousand microns and then we're going to shut off our vacuum pump and we're going to add nitrogen Gen, break with nitrogen yep. break with nitrogen that just means we're adding nitrogen to zero atmospheric right. yeah, and i get that question right? a lot like what why are we doing that and that's what we have to explain to and them. that's going to bring any <clears throat> moisture that is in that system that's attached to the to the inside of the pipe by something called adhesion Right? And it could be just atmospheric moisture, moisture yeah. not water, just right, moisture right, right. in the yeah. air, right? And at that point, we're going to continue to pull a vacuum. We're going to pull down to 1,500, 1500 microns, yep. right? Again, break with nitrogen, bring it up to atmospheric. And then we're going to bring that system down to 500 microns, maybe even lower. Pull a nice deep vacuum. Yeah, you should it be you have can to go stop down at 500. Right. Um, it, you, you, you're not going to pull any oil out of the system. Don't be afraid. It, pull down to 200 microns, 100 microns if right. you can. Right. And at that point, we're going to conduct a rise test. And we have to make sure that that mic, and this is important because um, we've talked about this in past podcasts, and uh, I think Juan brought it up, where he's gone on to job sites and seen the micron gauge looking at the vacuum pump side instead of the system side. You know, it's funny. I was going to ask you that. Where is the best place to put your micron gauge? Is it at the pump? Is it at at the unit? At the unit. At the the unit. The The farthest away you can get from the pump possible is the better. And if you can isolate with ball valves and core removal tools are great for that. Oh, they now they have valves. to be vacuum rated. Yes. yes. <laughs> not yep. just every core remover is really? vacuum rated. Really? Right. Okay. So, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, that that, that's really is that. Yeah. Okay. Good so, we know. have a micron gauge right. and we're isolating that micron gauge to see the system side. All right. And that's how we're doing our rise test. Now, now, now let me ask rise you this, test. Ralph. Go ahead. So, let me ask you this. So, you have two identical units, mm-hmm. right? Set by set. Same line set, lane, same everything. Right. One person, one uh, person does a triple evac. Mm-hmm. The other person goes. It just turns on the vacuum, goes down to five hundred microns. Right. Which one's going to be faster? So I guess that would depend on the line set length. No, uh, if, they, I, if they're, they're identical, are, identical, identical, units. identical. Everything's identical. Wouldn't in theory the triple evac be faster? It would because if there's any moisture at all, yeah, exactly. Because that every line, time you're doing you're that, getting, break yeah. with nitrogen, and then yeah. you're uh, uh, break. Yeah. It's yeah. actually okay. faster. It takes more steps, but it's actually faster. Yeah, it yes. actually. And and if guys would just start doing it and just start practicing it, just like everything else, yeah. it just gets easier. It comes yeah. with uh, second repetition. nature. Right? Yep. Yeah. So let's finish up the vacuum, the triple evac. Right. We've talked about the evacuations, what we bring it down to, and then the rise test. Right. 
it's always going to rise. Oh, <laughs> no matter what, yeah, it's point. always going to rise. Yep. It does, yes. It does. Right? So let's talk about it only rises a little. What does that mean? You're good at that point. But if you go about now, see, I've heard different, different things. I've heard if you stay below 1,000 microns, you're good. Right, but that's why I like these new micron gauges because they will tell you yeah. if you pass or fail. But, you know, let's look at a system with 25 feet of line set or a system with 2,000 feet of line set. Right. It's now, a big difference totally, on the rise test there. Right, right. Right? Definitely, definitely. So, you know, residential versus commercial, bigger system, a lot of more indoor units. You may see a bigger rise on rise your back. On that. Right. Now, let's, we talked about a dry system. We're talking about a brand new installation. Everything's, oh, you know, yes. nice and simple. Now let's talk about pulling a vacuum on a system. We just changed a, com uh, a Co component. A com Maybe yeah. we changed like a compressor or whatever. We changed LEV on. valve. Well, let's say the compressor we didn't change and it was in there and it's got refrigerant in the oil. Am I'm I going to have a tough time pulling a vacuum? Yes. Oh, yeah. Because why? Why are you going to have We're just time? constantly boiling off refrigerant. Boiling exactly. off refrigerant. And so, this is why I miss R11. So... <laughs> <laughs> People don't understand that anywhere there's oil, you're gonna, your refrigerant's going to boil off that oil. So you may have, let's say um, when we tell people to remove the refrigerant from a system, right? Take it all out. Yeah. Well, if you weigh it out, you're always going to be short on refrigerant. Right. Because there's oil, there's refrigerant still left in that compressor. Yeah, and PoE oil, yeah, it it is, oil. Is, is, the, is really much different than mineral oil. PoE yes. oil mixes very well with refrigerant, yes. so it likes to, it, yeah. it stays with that refrigerant. And in trying to get that refrigerant to come out of that oil right. is a lot tougher than back in the day of R22 and mineral oil, right? They're like Paul was saying earlier, it's a much different world today with 410A and, po and these polyester oils. Um, so you got to keep that in mind, and you're going to have you're going to struggle a little bit to get that re all that refrigerant out. Um, I've, I've told some guys from time to time that you know back in the day it's 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 still a thing now, but it's gone away. Is is pistons in a conventional system, right. right? Let's say you had some thoughts that maybe that piston was in backwards, maybe or maybe there wasn't a piston in the system, right? You can pump that unit down, crack that thing open, open it up just to check. Put it back together, and you're good. Yeah, you don't even have to pull a vacuum because it's it's pulling off, and you're always under positive pressure. I got you. Yeah. Yeah. But people are like, "That's not true. You can't do that." Because in their mind, you've opened that thing up. Yeah, but it's the you pressure. Know. Pressure yeah. always pressure, goes from positive yeah. to negative. I used yeah. to I used to just leave if I had to do that. Just leave a few pounds of positive right. pressure in there, and you're good. Right. Yeah. But just yeah. be careful with that piston because I shot one across an attic one time. <laughs> All right. and that was know, no fun. I, I had to look in the insulation for that piston and it took me hours. I was on a job the other day that had a uh, strainer that stopped up. And um, I checked it. I know we're not getting, we're getting a little off of the. Uh, That's all right. But so I used a pack tool just to show the guy what the pack tool looked like. And I, I checked my suction line temperature and it was 57 degrees. No. Then I checked a liquid line temperature. I just flipped the dip switch. It was a, it was eleven degrees. I said, "There's got to be something wrong with pack tool." So I got the maintenance tool out, plugged it in. By the time I plugged it in, that liquid line was at five degrees. Wow! Dang. So I I told that there was two of them. So go up to the attic, take the liquid line loose. You, let's recover refrigerant first. You take the liquid, take the suction line loose. You shoot nitrogen in there. Now take a rag up there with you. Well, he had so tight against the flare that he said the guy outside was shooting the nitrogen through the liquid line. It kept shooting back at him. He said, man, it's really restricted. So the guy upstairs, he pulled the, the rag away. Yeah. And as soon as he did, boom. he said it shot out like a bullet and almost hit his arm. Yeah. I said, you find it? He said, no, man, I wish I could. Yes. That's a bad day. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, a, bad day. Day. that's a really bad day. That just day. happened the other day. All right. But, does that finish it? For, yeah, that, for that, that about covers it. I hope this, this, this episode helped anyone out there understand, um, how, you know, how important it is to pull a triple evacuate oh, definitely. Um, on a system and, you know, gave you some tips on some tools that you should be using, right? Um, tools so, at the end of the day, you should not be ha having to diagnose your tools oh, when yeah, you're working. Yeah, yeah. That's the, right the worst, tools. right? Yeah, you're only as good as your tools. It is. But one thing I do want to say, we talked, to, we talked about the bigger the hose, the 
you know, getting this, getting that. But for the younger techs, you know, they're living check to check or whatever. So don't be, don't think you have to go and get the latest and greatest stuff. Right. And spend thousands and, spend and thousands of dollars because you don't have to. Yeah. Just get a good size vacuum rated hose. Right. So, Ralph, we've mentioned that you grew up in Texas, but you don't live in Texas now. Who do you work for and where in the country do you work? So I work for Ferguson mm-hmm. and I'm, of course, DSG here. Um, and I live in Anderson, South Carolina. Okay. So, and you have training centers that you teach classes. Where do you teach those classes? I have three training centers I teach out of. I teach out of Asheville, North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina, nice. and Union City, North Carolina. I like or Charlotte. Union City, Georgia. Georgia yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, Ralph. So you're, you're in the Carolina, Georgia area. Right, you got those classes there. They're going to go to the Ferguson. They do a Google search for Ferguson in those areas. They'll find your branches. Right. The guys out there in those areas know where the branches are. Give them a call, and they can tell them all about the classes right. and so on. What we'll do is we'll email you a flyer, and from that flyer, there's a QR code on there. Yep. They'll just scan it, and they'll um, sign up for one of the classes. Beautiful. And we also have one in Raleigh, a training center in Raleigh and Wilmington. Yes. So we have five in, in uh, yeah. North Carolina. Five yep. and you do you only teach out of the three. I teach out of the yeah. And okay. Al, your counterpart, teaches the other. Yeah, Al okay. teaches out of the. Yep. Al. Al's not here today. Al, hope you feel better. Yeah. We'll see you next time. <laughs> All right, thanks for Ralph. Thanks for me. joining us. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Take thanks care. for having me. All right. So, do you do uh, barbecue? Every once in a while, I've yeah. been known to. No, I say it. <laughs> no, so Scott, I got a question for you. What do you think about gas grills? Is that barbecuing? I have nothing wrong with that. I don't own one. No. I own four, uh, four, uh, uh, two charcoals, a uh, stick burner, and then I have a what do you call it? A Smoky Joe. Wait a minute. I have a burger. I want to throw on the grill. You're gonna have to wait for the charcoal. <laughs> so the funny yeah. thing is, a lot of I, that's the biggest complaint I get, where people saying it takes forever for the charcoal grill to go. Get a chimney uh, starter. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the quickest way. Because uh, uh, you're telling me when you light up a gas grill, and me, immediately when you light that sucker up, you're putting a burger I'm, on. I'm waiting five minutes. I'm up to a couple hundred degrees. I throw the burger on there. Sure. See, if, it depends. If the burger's frozen, I'll throw it on right then and there. Let it thaw out a little bit. <laughs> I don't care. You know, of course yeah, you would. A, yeah. Paul's using a George Foreman grill. Yeah, I, listen, I used to have a George Foreman grill. My wife doesn't listen to this show, so I'm safe for this. She got mad at me because I didn't clean it after cooking a pound of bacon. She she threw it out in the driveway. It broke. I bet she did. You're, no. you're so in trouble. Her next birthday, I bought her one. That didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs>